how do we approach the evaluation of energy derivatives in a quantum Monte Carlo framework? Uh, to hit you with the most obvious point first, uh, the reason is, is because we're interested in a lot of other things other than energy, like uh, there are many quantities such as pressures, magnetizations, bulk moduli, compressibilities that are actually uh, either single derivatives or multi or uh, second derivatives of the total energy with respect to various thermodynamic quantities. Uh, and so that's obviously we'd like that in a computationally efficient manner. But uh, on a deeper level, for the understanding of solids and various properties, what we're really interested in is locating one, the local minima in our Born-Oppenheimer energy surface, and two, characterizing what that uh, local minimum looks like. And so now, you know, from various numerical like uh, root finding and uh, optimization sort of procedures, we technically do not need forces or uh, energy derivatives at all. However, it is very nice to be able to look at an energy derivative and say, oh, this is zero. You know, that's a good indication of a minimum. Uh, and so, uh, so yeah, so finding the minima is pretty important, and that has applications for things like structure searching. But also, it's like once we have a minima, uh, many properties are described uh, by the shape of the local minima, such as like phonons, for instance, can be viewed as like perturbations around that. And so, yeah, it's like uh, it would be very nice to evaluate these in a quick, uh, efficient manner. And so um, as far as the ground state calculations go, DFT routinely does this uh, in applications such as structural optimization. Uh, and you know it is very, very routine now that uh, if I start off with a given structure, I can optimize both the atomic positions and the cell geometries. Uh, and uh, it's so routine now that they've actually been able to do uh, structure searching with, uh, with density functional theory, where basically they take a whole bunch of random configurations in a box and uh, relax those and see which ones have the lowest enthalpies. Uh, and as I said before, it's like, uh, you know, we can calculate phonon spectra pretty routinely within the uh, DFT framework. Uh, I cite the frozen phonon technique because this is going to be the uh, this is going to be the method that we're going to uh, most obviously be able to do in a quantum Monte Carlo framework. But uh, again, it's like uh, in this method, what you do is you, uh, as David said, uh, introduce a phonon. You introduce a modulation in your system, calculate the energy difference between that and your equilibrium geometry, and then build up a second derivative matrix. Uh, and finally, we have the quantum molecular dynamics, uh, which is very, very routine. Density functional theory can calculate the forces on all the ions and propagate them forward in either a classical or a path integral sort of framework. For each of these, uh, Quantum Monte Carlo has been able to look at uh, certain aspects of these, but in general, it's very expensive to do so. Uh, as in, like, uh, as we mentioned before, it's very straightforward to do a structural optimization for a simple structure. Or uh, high, highly symmetric structure like BCC or FCC or uh, various orthorhombic configurations, but in general, uh, you don't see quantum Monte Carlo applied to you know the general sorts of problems, and that's primarily because of cost at this point. And so, uh, before getting into the technical challenges, uh, you know you often hear it's like, well, uh, even though DFT might not be uh, good for energies. Uh, or in some cases, you know, energy differences and everything else, well, at least the forces are good. And so what I'm showing here is a plot of, it's basically a cold curve that we've calculated for uh, uh, high pressure hydrogen. And so what we see over here are various structures uh, that have been predicted from first principles. And what we show is the enthalpy difference relative to the C2C phase as a function of pressure. And of course, the way you'd establish like a, the stability of a hydrogen phase is to see which one has the lowest enthalpy. Uh, now, what this plot is showing is that the solid lines are with structures optimized using a van der Waals DF functional, and the dashed lines are with uh, PBE. And what I want to point out here is that, is that in several parts of the phase diagram, you actually get significant differences in enthalpies depending on which function you use. Oh, I should also mention that these points are calculated with quantum Monte Carlo, so this is not within the density functional uh, framework for those. But just choosing two different functionals to optimize your structures, you get uh, as much as a millihartree difference, particularly over here, and also some qualitatively different or behaviors of the cold curves. For instance, with the van der Waals DF, we see these two uh, structures being very, very similar in enthalpy, whereas with PBE, we see these diverging. And so, 
uh, the idea is, is that like in these types of situations and where accuracy really matters, we would like to be able to apply quantum Monte Carlo uh, yeah, to answer questions like this. Uh, okay, so uh, for the purpose of this talk, I mean, uh, I'm going to be focusing on energy derivatives with respect to various structural properties. And uh, just to be explicit, we're talking about forces uh, on the ions, which are defined as the negative gradient of the total energy, and the stresses, uh, which uh, you can think of this as uh, uh, if I take a unit cell and uh, basically force a slight deformation on it, which is uh, described by the symmetric matrix over here, then the stress, or the, this is a strain matrix, the stress is going to be the uh, basic energy derivative with respect to the strain. Now the problem with doing this, uh, with doing energy derivatives in general in quantum Monte Carlo is uh, seen by this diagram over here, is that unlike in density functional theory or other sorts of like uh, quantum chemistry methods, uh, we are actually sampling the wave function and we're actually sampling or, and we're using samples to construct an estimate of the energy. And so all of our quantities have error bars on them. And so uh, if you're going to try to estimate the slope of this line over here, for instance, you'd have to take into account the fact that we don't actually know this energy. And so uh, our estimate for the uh, derivative over here could actually be anywhere within this little shaded uh, region. And as you know from just how finite differences work, the way you'd get more accurate estimates of this quantity within a finite difference framework is to decrease your uh, step size over here. I mean to bring these two points closer together so that they approximate this curve even better. But as you do that, the uh, error associated with the, inter uh, with the estimate of the slope gets extremely large. And so there's definitely a trade-off between, uh, between the statistical error you have in your simulation and the systematic errors you have in your finite difference. Uh, yes? That is absolutely true, but the problem still kind of remains. Is we can, and um, there's still a trade-off between the systematic and the statistical error. Uh, and that's, so, I mean, this is just uh, for pedagogical purposes. I mean, because, yes, as you said, there are much higher order things. And for some of the results I'll show later, our uh, results are against a higher order method. I mean, but in general, because of, uh, I mean, just to be explicit, uh, because we have errors over here, uh, the variance of your estimate of the energy derivative is going to go like something like this. I mean, this is just a very elementary calculation of error bars and error propagation. But the important thing I want to point out is that we have this step size down in the denominator. So as you decrease the step size, your variance goes up. Yes? So you just comment to him, like if you take the next order formula, you get E plus two times E plus E minus. You got that two in there, so that doubles the error bar. So if you go to higher order, statistical errors can get larger. Can get larger? Yeah. So, so you know, it, you know, there's a trade-off. That's that's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's absolutely a trade-off. And uh, another thing you can see is that uh, as you go to uh, not just more accurate uh, finite difference formula, but al also as you try to go to higher derivatives, like second and third derivatives, then you run the exact same problem, uh, except additionally you're going to have other powers down here. So, so yeah, I mean, like, uh, so, the, so what we want to do is we want to be able to estimate this as efficiently as possible. Now, uh, one of the things I have neglected over here is this term over here which, uh, I mean, the actual formula is, you know, I add the variances of these guys together, but I'm going to subtract off essentially a term that depends on the correlation between the estimates here and the estimates here. So, um, uh, so in the limit of, you know, completely uncorrelated simulations, this term would be zero, and then we'd be left with this guy up here. So, um, the first thing that we do, and it's typically been done to uh, attack problems like this in a computationally tractable manner have been the use of correlated sampling. And so uh, before going into correlated sampling, I just want to show that this is pretty much how we would do it uh, with non-correlated sampling. As in, we calculate a simulation, estimate the energy here, estimate the energy here, run two independent simulations, calculate the energies, and then look at the differences, propagate the errors and such. But the thing I want to point out is that as you uh, as these wave functions approach each other, the variance of your estimate of the energy difference actually goes like twice. And I mean, assuming you have the same error bar here. So that's a bummer. 
uh, we can actually do better. Uh, and so uh, just uh, as an exercise, uh, what you can do is you can take this quantity here and then uh, multiply, for instance, this quantity by uh, pi over here and divide by pi and then, you know, by suitable uh, algebraic manipulations you can actually write uh, the previous expression as this. And why do we do that? Why do we go through this? Well, the fact of the matter is because we're doing quantum Monte Carlo, we actually, or because we're doing Monte Carlo, we have quite a bit of freedom over the distribution we can sample. And the punchline here is that we can actually sample this energy difference in one go. Uh, that means if I have a trial wave function for configuration A and a trial wave function for configuration B, then not only can I sample the energy difference in one go, but I can also strongly correlate uh, these, two observ or these two measurements and thereby uh, drive down the error bar in my estimate. And uh, there are various ways to do this. I'm not going to go into too much detail over how you pick this. Uh, I mean, I'm just going to hit you with keywords. Uh, we can do something called umbrella sampling. Uh, I think that's what QMC PAC, you know, that is what QMC PAC uses within the code. But you have more sophisticated methods that are tailored more towards forces and stuff, and these are known as space warp uh, sorts of transformations. I've left a reference over there for the people who are curious. Uh, but the important bit is that as the uh, as the two trial wave functions approach each other, as in as you go to the uh, exact same system, your variance goes to zero for this estimate. So, you know, uh, and I mention this because um, uh, because QMC PAC is capable of doing this, and in general, like this, this is a very general framework. You think of a deformation, and you know, assuming there's not a whole lot of difference between the system and the system you're perturbing to, uh, you can really save in computational efficiency. Uh, and so this method also works rigorously within the VMC framework and the Reptation Monte Carlo framework, uh, which is significant because that's a uh, projector method. And uh, there are methods that are not implemented in QMC pack where you can do this approximately with DMC. Uh, so the disadvantages to this, however, is that you pretty much need a different trial wave function for each perturbation. Uh, so, you know, because we need to co compute these for each of the different geometries or each of the different perturbations. And so uh, that actually gets pretty expensive uh, when we start looking at like, well, stresses are manageable. You know, we have at most, uh, yes, six. <laughs> oh, oh, no, no, seven trial wave functions that you need for the stresses. One for the equilibrium and then one for, or one for the base and then one for the various strain perturbations. Uh, but you need a whopping 3n plus 1 if you want to do the forces generally. Yes? When you say different trial wave functions, uh, would something be sufficiently different if you just optimized it, one doing like 90, 10, and the other 80, 20? Is that considered different trial wave function? Or is um, I'm more referring to the fact that like uh, you're dealing with different Hamiltonians. You're not oh. looking at different, you know, uh, best solutions to the Hamiltonians. Uh, more like I have a water molecule here, or sorry, an H2 molecule here, and I consider one where okay. they're spread apart a little bit. So, um, okay. So, um, so the idea is, is like how can we get around doing finite differences? And one of the first things we can do, and this is well known within like uh, physics and chemistry, is something called the hellman feynman theorem. Where, uh, and it's basically stated that, you know, if psi is an eigenstate or if it's a variational minimum, uh, and uh, pretty much if it doesn't, exp or if your wave function doesn't explicitly depend on this perturbation, this can be a, you know, ionic coordinate, a stress, whatever, then you can actually write out the energy derivative as the expectation value of your Hamiltonian taken with respect to that uh, variational parameter, you know, like the uh, volume or something. And so the most reasonable thing for us to do is take this as our estimator. Um, so because we're using quantum Monte Carlo or Monte Carlo in general, we do have more stringent requirements than you know, density functional theory or other, quote, analytic theories. And that's that the mean and variance of this estimator must exist. And we also have to be aware that there might be a mixed estimator problem associated with this uh, if this doesn't commute with the Hamiltonian. So, uh, so one of the first things that uh, we're going to talk about uh, is if we simply crunch through this framework and everything else, as Nielsen and Martin did, uh, then we can actually produce a, an estimator for the stress tensor, uh, which you can see that, you know, it's like these are the kinetic energy operators for, as it stands right now, electrons, but, you know, this can be generalized. 
uh, and then we have the, you know, the derivative of the potential energy here. And what you can uh, verify is that this is actually a finite variance estimator. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, like it's, uh, it's actually reasonably efficient. You don't have to compute you know, seven different wave functions in one go. You can extract all the information from one simulation. Uh, and as it stands in QMC pack right now, uh, this, is, uh, this is an advanced feature. It's going to be fully online and ready for you guys to use soon. Uh, but it also currently only works for all electron bulk calculations. But you know, the extension of this uh, to pseudo potentials is you know, not bad. Uh, and the way you would end up using this is actually very simple. I mean, we have our Hamiltonian block over here. And uh, what we do is we just add a little simple tag like this. And uh, it's going to show up in your scalar.dat file. Uh, and so uh, some of the tests we've done have actually been on uh, uh, like actually a liquid uh, simulation for hydrogen. Uh, and so what we did was we looked at like 54 uh, hydrogen atoms at a density of RS 1.6. And we computed the uh, stresses using finite differencing and uh, with a stress estimator. And we didn't find any. Uh, we didn't find any disagreements with the uh, finite differencing results. Not only that, but when you trace your trace tensor, uh, you'll, or trace divided by three, you'll find that like, this is actually the same pressure we get by the virial theorem and several other methods. So uh, not only that, but we can also use this to compare against the stress tensors estimated by various density functional methods. And so what I have here is a stress tensor from QMC in uh, gigapascals. And then I have the percent error uh, of the LDA relative to this result. And so we see this is on the order of about six, you know, around six percent. Uh, for the off diagonals, it's pretty good except for this guy over here. Uh, and then as, as we see, it's like LDA is really good, PBE goes up, and then Van der Waals, uh, these get pretty horrible. HSC comes in uh, with the best overall. Uh, and uh, what's interesting though is that we've actually benchmarked hydrogen in this regime before and found that the trends of the pressure errors, just the pressure errors, mind you, have followed this exact same trend. And so we're seeing that like, not only is this giving us consistent results that agree with finite differencing, but it's also picking up the exact same trends that we know from nice, rigorous <laughs> studies. Excuse me. Yes? Uh, it is actually, this is with an extrapolated estimator. So it's with uh, diffusion Monte Carlo, variational Monte Carlo, and we're doing finite size corrections on top of this. So this is like the best you're going to get for a, you know, periodic disorder configuration of 54 atom. Yeah. So, yes. This stress uh, estimate here is using the Holman Feynman theory to evaluate. Essentially, yeah. And, and so just one, one question. Yeah. Is it is it possible to include higher order estimator but then the second order theory? Uh. Let me see. I personally have not looked at higher order derivatives, but there's two. I mean, in, in theory, no. But you have to worry about, uh, again, whether your estimator is like finite mean, finite variance, at which actually I'll illustrate the problems with this when we talk about forces over here. So let's pretend I try to do this exact same derivation, everything else with forces, where I just take a derivative of the potential energy. Uh, the problem is, is that even though we can get a, uh, a mean out of this, the variance is infinite in this case. And the way you can see that is what I've done is I've written the force on an atom situated at the origin uh, in polar coordinates. And so, you know, obviously, you know, this guy is well defined, these terms cancel, and everything's good. Now, if I want to take the average uh, of the, or if I want to evaluate the variance, what you'll see is that this factor does not cancel you know, the 1 over r to the fourth factor. And so as you, uh, you have a divergence over here. And so this means we can't use the central limit theorem. We might be able to, quote, evaluate a mean, but it doesn't mean anything if we can't bound it. Uh, and so uh, what is implemented in QMC pack was actually developed by uh, Simone Chiesa, uh, Dr. Separately, and uh, Xiwei Zhang. And uh, what it does is it treats the divergent term, uh, or it basically constrains the shape of the 1 over r potential as you go to the origin, and that's based on physical kind of motivations. 
And so the way that works is we split our estimator up into two parts. Uh, one is outside of a shell. This is going to be our exact Hellman Feynman uh, estimator. And then we have this little bit inside the shell. So far, there have been no approximations. This is still completely rigorous. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to define something called a force density. Uh, and what we're doing is, uh, or a radial force density. And basically what we're doing is we're taking the uh, solid angle part of this integral and just spherically averaging it. So you'll see that, okay, that's fine. You know, you can write this out. That's okay. Now the big insight here comes from the fact that on physical grounds, uh, this force density must go to zero linearly as r goes to zero. And the reason you can see that is assume that this guy does not go to zero at uh, r equals zero. Then what that means is that this cosine function averaged, or the average of this cosine over this density, um, you're basically going to have, have to have like a difference, an unphysical discontinuity in your density in order to produce, you know, something like this. Uh, I mean, a non-zero force. And so just, uh, if you put that constraint like by hand into this, uh, what you can show is that this is actually equivalent to filtering out the S-wave component of your density, the spherically symmetric part. Uh, and what I've done here is I've actually just expanded the uh, force density operator, uh, or the force density, in terms of spherical harmonics. You can show that as you chop the, or as you force R to go to zero, the A component here has to, you know, uh, be zero as well. So what's the consequence of this? What's the consequence of this ob observation? How does it help us in terms of uh, actually constructing an estimator? And here's what it looks like. Uh, inside uh, a certain cutoff radius, you're going to have your 1 over r squared sort of potential or, uh, or force term uh, multiplied by this little weighting factor. Uh, and it turns out that we can actually derive the exact analytic form of this weighting factor uh, just based on the previous physical concerns. And outside, we're just going to take the normal Hellman Feynman. And so, uh, and so what you can show is that this is finite variance. Uh, it's not zero variance, it's not uh, zero bias, but it is systematically improvable, and it's also very, very easy to code. Uh, additionally, there are only three uh, parameters that you uh, play with to adjust the uh, statistical and uh, accuracy properties of this. One is the, uh, th this is like a weighting factor that goes on to your R square, or your uh, uh, radial term. Uh, this is going to be the number of terms you include in your polynomial expansion of this function, and the R is, of course, the cutoff. So um, using this in QMC pack is actually extremely straightforward. Again, your, uh, this is the syntax over here where we control the cutoff radius, the, uh, the degree of your polynomial, and the, uh, and the term over here, this weight, weighting factor. And of course, like everything else, it comes up in your scale.dat file. But uh, I guess the important thing is, it's like, well, how does this hold up under testing? Uh, and so what we did was we actually considered this very simple system uh, of four hydrogen atoms uh, in an extremely kind of compressed and deformed state. Uh, and what we did was we tested the uh, Chiesa separately Jang estimator uh, for this cutoff and this basis with you know, a weighting factor of two, and we compared this against finite differencing. And so what we see here is that um, this number over here is the, is the estimator uh, with variational Monte Carlo. This one over here is with uh, diffusion Monte Carlo. Now, if you sample just within the diffusion Monte Carlo framework, you're going to get a mixed estimator. And so this is actually going to be biased based on the quality of your trial wave function. However, there are methods by which we can actually project out the uh, pure estimate. And this was actually done by forward walking, but you can also do this in reptation. Um, and finally, we compare this against the PBE force estimate. And so what you see is that, you know, uh, uh, is for this one over here, there is a little bit of a disagreement. Uh, what I'd also want to point out, though, is that the scale over here between these forces over here and these forces is about a factor of five. And so when you actually, like, uh, sit down and uh, look at, like, how big this error is, I mean, we're basically talking about two parts in a thousand. So. Uh, if we increase the, or if we decrease the cutoff radius and increase the interpolating polynomial, we can actually drive this back down. But um, as for this force over here, it's spot on. 
And of course, we were able to do this in one single go without doing any sort of like uh, finite differencing scheme. So we actually get a significant gain in uh, efficiency. Uh, so uh, we've also tested this in bulk calculations. Uh, and uh, we found that the estimators actually agree with finite differencing. We did this by drawing uh, about three different atoms from uh, a 54 atom configuration and doing the full uh, correlated sampling on it. So this method does work in the solids. Uh, I mean, mathematically as well as practically speaking. Uh, we've implemented this with an optimized breakup scheme as has been described earlier in this lab. Uh, and what we see though is that uh, we're looking at the use of this for uh, benchmarking applications. And so what we see here is uh, we've, this was to complement our previous hydrogen benchmarking work, but what we see here is uh, this axis over here is uh, the density functional theory predicted force uh, and the error relative to QMC. And uh, what I've done is I've basically gone through all 54 atoms and I've taken all the stress or all the force components and I've tabulated the errors for all of them. And so uh, we see the DFT force over here relative to the error. And so, uh, okay, that's fine. But what I want to point out is that this is the force error relative to HSE. And so the error distributions for all these force components is actually uh, very, very similar for uh, both of these methods. Uh, additionally, you know, you look at the outliers over here and they're kind of in the same place. Basically, uh, QMC and HSE give kind of qualitatively, or they, they give qualitatively similar pictures except uh, the ultimate determinant here is going to be in terms of like which one is, uh, which one is numerically better which it seems like uh, uh, what I would read from this is that uh, HSC predicts uh, variations from PBE that are much less extreme than QMC does. But again, the error distributions are very, very similar. Um, and so with the Chiesa separately Jang estimator to summarize, uh, it's simple, uh, it's accurate, and it's actually very efficient for light elements. Um, now the disadvantage disadvantages are um, is that it's a mixed estimator, so you do have to go through the additional machinery of uh, doing either an extrapolated estimate or a forward walking, reptation sort of thing. Uh, the more problematic aspect is that the error bars on these forces scales unfavorably with atomic number. As in, we're very, very good in hydrogen, kind of okay in helium. We might be able to get up to lithium, but this, uh, this is the error bar, by the way. This is not the variance, so you'll have to square this. <laughs> So uh, additionally, um, the estimator is, uh, the variance is controlled by uh, more like intrinsic properties of the system and of the estimator itself. It's kind of like the potential energy, how um, the potential energy is not a zero variance quantity, for instance. Local energy is. Um, but to go beyond this, uh, and this is actually the, uh, the method that's used and uh, being used actively by several groups, is that we want to ask ourselves the question of whether or not we can drive down the variance of these forces and whether or not we can construct an estimator in such a way that uh, with the quality, or if we can increase the quality of our trial wave function, can we improve the efficiency of our simulation by dropping the variance and by decreasing the bias of our estimate? And the answer is yes, that is doable. Uh, and so Asraf Kafarel originally laid down the framework here uh, and what the estimator looks like is essentially this, where this is your bare hellman feynman term. Uh, this is going to be what's called a zero variance term in the sense that like uh, if you average this over the simulation, it's always going to give you zero on average. However, uh, this is going to have compensating fluctuations to decrease the, uh, the variance of this quantity over here. And lastly, we have a zero variance or a zero bias term, which serves to decrease the systematic errors of this estimate and also goes to zero in the limit that your uh, wave function approaches the true wave function. I should also mention that this lambda over here is a derivative of the trial wave function with respect to lambda. I'm just, I just put it like that to save uh, screen space. Um, and so yeah, um, this estimator can actually be derived in a very similar manner uh, as the hellman feynman theorem, as in you just take the uh, estimate of your energy and just derive, or take a derivative with respect to every term. Don't cancel anything, and, and so you'll be left with this guy. 
Uh, the advantages are uh, is that as your trial wave function approaches the true ground state wave function and as the uh, trial wave function derivative approaches the uh, true trial, uh, wave function derivative, the variance of this estimate goes to zero and it approaches the true uh, derivative of the ground state energy. Um, and so the advantages over the current estimator is that it is, uh, the efficiency is tied more to the quality of the trial wave functions and not necessarily the underlying uh, distribution or the system. Uh, and it is possible that the errors might scale much better. I mean, just if you can come up with a better description of the core electrons, for instance, you can really reduce a lot of the variance coming from there. Uh, the disadvantage is, is that it's really complex when you start getting into uh, more sophisticated trial wave functions. And so, you know, you do need the machinery to uh, optimize and take derivatives of objects like this. And it's basically, um, there's two ways to do that. Either one, throw a lot of graduate student time at it, or do this algorithmic differentiation scheme where you can actually go through and take a lot of these derivatives automatically. Um, Additionally, um, you can show rigorously that in the case of forces, if you have the right cusp conditions, this term will actually cancel off the 1 over r squared divergence in your force. However, that will introduce a uh, problem when you're doing fixed node calculations, where this guy is known to go to zero. And so these technical issues have been worked out. Uh, however, they, you know, it's another level of complexity. Uh, additionally, like in terms of like, uh, the, the, this method is actually kind of, kind of new, as in within the past 10 years. And so there's a lot of questions, a lot of research questions that, uh, that we still need to address. Like, you know, it's like, uh, you know, what is a good trial wave function derivative, for instance? And uh, there's just a lot of room to improve these things. And of course, you know, what's the best way to optimize this object so we get the best variance and everything else. There are several ways to do it, uh, but you know, these are just questions that we've been dealing with in normal quantum Monte Carlo for a very long time, and you know, we need to go through a similar evolution process for these. So uh, just to briefly cover like the sort of research that's being done in the QMC community in this direction, uh, I'm just going to point out like uh, Sandro Sorella. Uh, he uh, has basically uses the asaraf caffarel estimators with both variational and diffusion Monte Carlo. If you're interested, you can read uh, this reference for the asaraf caffarel but he has two papers, or uh, I'm going to highlight two papers where um, when you have QMC forces, you can start doing uh, applications that, as I mentioned at the beginning, have been strictly within the view of like uh, molecular, di or sorry, density functional theory until now. And particularly one of the things he's done is like developed a uh, quantum molecular dynamics algorithm where he's able to deal with the fact you have noisy forces within a generalized Langevin thermostat sort of framework. And so we're already seeing, you know, uh, QMC hitting areas where uh, traditionally DFT is only done. And of course, you know, he's done a lot with algorithmic differentiation, you know, to basically uh, be able to evaluate, you know, these uh, various wave function derivatives in a way that, you know, spares graduate students. Um, additionally, at March meeting, um, there's a group over in, I think this is uh, University College London, uh, and uh, they're basically doing algorithmic differentiation and a very similar thing to Sorella, but they're using DMC and I believe their test I saw like a water molecule or something. Uh, in a completely different vein, uh, we have uh, this group over here, uh, uh, you know, Scani, Filippi, and Moroni, who are doing nudged elastic band calculations with uh, QMC. And again, I believe this is still within the asaraf caffarel framework, but what's interesting about this is they're basically implicitly doing structural optimizations uh, within the QMC framework. And I believe they're using the linear method. I'll have to double check that. But um, there was a talk by Moroni uh, last year where they've talked about a lot of the uh, improvements they've made to the asaraf caffarel framework, including clever additions to the zero variance term and stuff. Uh, and so they're getting reasonably efficient and re reasonably accurate forces for somewhat complicated systems. Uh, last, uh, this is molecular though. You know, so the idea is, is ultimately we want to extend this to, or we want to hit solids <laughs> with this and s have like, you know, predictions on solids, phonons and solids and stuff like this. So 
Um, so this is very good, but it certainly needs to be extended. Uh, and lastly, uh, this is the work I'm doing with uh, Dr. Separately, where uh, we're currently benchmarking stresses and forces in hydrogen, hydrogen helium mixtures uh, right now. And we're at this point using the Kiesa Separately Jang estimator. Although uh, one of the things I'm interested in is actually getting um, uh, getting the Asraf Kafferel stuff into the code in a robust and user-friendly way, uh, and start flushing out a lot of the applications that these that all these groups have done. Um, so, uh, what I want to say is that like not only is it theoretically possible to do forces and stresses in quantum Monte Carlo, we are at a time now where it's like these uh, calculations are starting to become more and more routine and moving on to more complicated systems. And so uh, there are already groups that are flushing out the possibilities of doing structural optimization, of doing molecular dynamics in, with quantum Monte Carlo, and also uh, doing phonon calculations. Uh, as it stands right now, QMC PAC uh, very well within the next like you know uh, release or so definitely supports the stresses and keys of separately Jang estimators at least for all electron calculations and lastly uh, we are currently undergoing research uh, to extend uh, or to basically use these forces in these applications and to hopefully include that in QMC pack in a way that again is nice and user friendly uh, so Anyone who's interested in flushing this out or asking or is curious about the capabilities of the code or any of the technical implementations, please feel free to talk to me. Uh, and lastly, I would like to acknowledge uh, my advisor, Dr. Separately, for, you know, uh, very, for, well, one, the estimator, uh, two, the uh, discussions and advice and guidance, uh, Dr. Miguel Morales, who uh, I will be working with very closely in getting this stuff into QMC PAC and then the QMC PAC team uh, for having the code and you know, being uh, supportive. So uh, lastly, uh, because this has been an energy derivative talk and a force talk, um, I have not given these two methods like uh, the recognition they deserve, but frankly it's like there are, um, so in quantum Monte Carlo there have actually been several techniques to get around the fact that we don't have forces. You know, uh, and so uh, a lot of these techniques we talk about, like you know, molecular dynamics, or you know, talking about like uh, sampling the canonical distribution for ions and stuff, uh, has already been done, and has already been has produced a lot of good science using the quantum Monte Carlo framework, and even without having uh, energy, de energy, yeah, energy derivatives. But with the presence of forces, this you know will definitely help out, like improving the efficiency of this method. Uh, so lastly, it's like, you know, we have this structural optimization by uh, Lucas Wagner and, uh, and Grossman, where again, it's like, you know, they've been able to show that they can do structural optimization in an unbiased manner, uh, basically without using any sort of forces, I mean. So these methods have done a very good job in dealing with the statistical uncertainties and basically getting unbiased results out of them. But both these methods will certainly be complemented by the addition of uh, forces and more inf more information is always better <laughs> in these situations. And so, uh, so that's pretty much my talk. Again, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, if anyone has any questions, 